you can go ahead. Yeah, streaming has not started yet. Ranjan, I think you can see, you can start. It's all right. Yeah, I can start, but the streaming is not yet seen on the YouTube. So I some of we need to be refreshed, maybe. Uh, I again going back to the same link and try again. But has it stopped? No, it's not showing my screen on YouTube, it should come up. Because those YouTube guys will miss out, that's why. It will take about 20 seconds, there is a delay. You can go ahead. Oh, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, the first talk of my two talks. One is today and one is tomorrow. And uh, I will be covering on very basic things about observational astronomy. So the first part of the talk uh, is on telescopes in which I will talk different types of telescopes. Uh, even the earlier talks in this week have covered some things, but I will go into right into the definition level of uh, photometry uh, parameters, magnitude of stars and distances and so on at fairly basic level. And then I will move on to black body radiation, which most of you are aware, but in astronomy and astrophysical context, what are the, Implications will be clear from that. And then slowly, uh, I will move on to the photometry uh, and then spectroscopy. And I mean, I'm giving the full picture, including tomorrow's talk. And at the end of tomorrow's talk, uh, there will be a list of uh, reference, uh, mostly books, which uh, you can see. And quite a few of these books are available either online or you can buy. And particularly there is a series made by IGNU in which we have authored two chapters. So that reference also will be there and that book is also online. So with those words, I'm starting now. And <clears throat> all of you of course know telescope, uh, which is a very basic thing uh, in 2008. Most of you were somewhat young that time. Uh, it was called as the year of astronomy because it was actually 400 years since Galileo first actually invented a telescope. In fact, the telescope by name was not existing, but people had spectacles, so lenses were there. But actually Galileo used two lenses. Mirrors came much later, much, much later. So he used a four inch size telescope, which is still kept in Italy. And uh, that, was a major event celebrated all over the world. And uh, so that was kind of a, you know, kind of giving respect to his invention. And many of you may not be aware, but it was also 2008 was year of uh, uh, evolution or Darwin actually. So anyway, that's a side point. So if I just give you the outline of this first part of the talk, which is, uh, going to be on small telescopes, different types. Then I will talk about refractive, which uses lenses, and then reflective, which came only about 100 years back. And then advantages and disadvantages of both these types. Then basic definitions like magnification, light gathering power, different types of mounts. And the last part of this particular talk will be on black body radiation, as you all know, but how it directly implies into astronomy. That will be clear in this. So with that outline, let's first say, uh, a telescope is basically, so I should also tell this, both these talks, the PDFs can be shared uh, with uh, the coordinators and you can, they can probably mail you, they will have your email IDs. So if people want, uh, you can ask for copies of it. So I will just leave it with uh, a scene uh, so that uh, it can be, uh, distributed. Okay, so telescope is a device used to form images of distant objects. Now, uh, if you uh, see, uh, so the most uh, common mistake which a normal young boy or a girl or a school kid asks a question in a 
outreach activities how far can i see with this telescope so as we will see almost in the first half an hour of this talk that most of this question itself is wrong why because it's not a question of how far so telescope has two advantages one is magnification and also light collecting which we will define soon so uh, when you talk of magnification the best way is suppose you are sitting in your room or something and on the opposite side you have a window or or a picture let's say that i'm sure all of you have so wherever you are sitting two edges of this picture or the window if you draw a line from your eye that will be an angle right some theta angle it will be a triangle starting from your point of eye which is your apex and the base will be the edges of this photo or a window now that angle is something which is important which is also called field of view later on we will see now if i try to see finer features of that picture or photo or even the grill of your window then that angle is reducing right so you are increasing the magnification so this is a very crude way i can explain what is magnification but i think it conveys what i mean by magnification and light gathering power of a telescope so bigger the light, uh, area of the telescope uh it will collect more light and everybody knows one by r square law in optics so obviously it goes by area so these two things will again come very soon in after a couple of slides and telescopes are of two types what galileo made which was almost 3 400 years was mostly with lenses and very soon we will see in the slides that the glass itself had a lot of problems and that's why in the last more or less 100 years people have not used uh refractive telescopes although there is one picture which i will show which is still used and it has some advantage otherwise most of the telescopes now are made of uh, reflecting mirrors although i am sure i did it in your school days you must have made a small binocular by in cheap uh, lenses from uh, a lab market in the in the city so that also has its own problem we will see what is called as color aberration so let's move now refractive telescope uses a glass lens as its objective and that is usually the the largest part which collects the light and then it is refracted and passes through this lens and finally you see it in the eyepiece so this picture now i will show with my cursor this is the top one is the refracting telescope this is the lens or this is the area of the collecting area of the telescope and it gets inverted here and you can see it with the eyes in contrast the reflecting telescope is slightly different you will see that except for a lens here most of it there is no refracting optics here so the light comes here from infinity this is parallel ray it gets reflected at its primary mirror which can be concave or other shapes or parabolic and at the secondary mirror it goes from the side there is a version where this light can come out from here we will soon see that so these are the two basic types of telescope so again this is the same thing incoming light objective lens and focus here it can be a detector or your human eye this is again another point which i will not cover in these two talks today and tomorrow is about the detector the human eye was the only detector in the last almost 100 110 years after that the photoelectric photometry started which means you could actually have a photocell which could collect this light and give you a signal either electric or something you had also photography for quite some time and you had to develop those films and so on so uh, but photoelectric thing was the final change from photography although photography also we could do you could scan un under a under a instrument and get the density of the of the photography film and convert it into numbers but it was a quite cumbersome thing we did it in a given hour phd times but those days are almost gone now so detector is a very important part here and uh, of course i am not going to directly cover detector except by making remarks when we talk about the photometry and spectroscope it is again the same thing i can skip this so i was telling you about a telescope still in use uh, this is at lick observatory in us and you can see the person standing here and <clears throat> such a long telescope and see it's all a sealed tube it has its advantages the 
objective lens is here and there is the eyepiece here, the person has to sit here, or if it moves along this axis or this axis, then the person has to move with a chair, which will be on a ladder and so on. So this kind of telescope is still used for various reasons we will see later. But although now it's very rare to have telescopes of this kind. So what are the advantages? They are very rugged. After initial alignment, you know, it's, it's very resistant. It won't get misaligned and so on, unlike the reflector telescopes. The glass surface inside is all sealed. You saw the picture, it's all sealed inside. So there is no question of dust or air entering. So which is a very good thing. It doesn't require any cleaning. And since it is closed from outside, the air currents inside the dome, this is the dome inside, there is no uh, effect of the air currents. Here. So that is a big advantage and changes in temperature don't affect it. So it's much steadier. And though, as I said, some of them are still made, but there are major disadvantages we will we'll soon see, which is why uh, people had to go to reflect, uh, reflecting telescopes about 100 years back. So what was the biggest problem, which is why I was hinting in the school days, you must have made this thing. You would see these nice color rings. This is actually called color aberration and which was a very big drawback. Uh, and you can see from this colored image that the different colors are getting focused on this. This is called the focal, in this case, it is focal ray, but it's uh, the focal line, but actually it's also a plane because the, you can see the three dimensional or two dimensional from this side. So you will see the colors are getting focused, each one at different point. So it's, it's not uh, focused at the same point. The only one solution, partial solution was to make a planar convex lens, which to some extent could focus them together. So this was a major drawback. So there are a couple of ways. Uh, other, other problem is that when you pass the light through a telescope, nowadays telescopes, are, you must have heard from other talks, right from ultraviolet to X-rays to radio, there's so much of variety we will see later in the spectroscopy talk that uh, many wavelengths get obstructed through the glass. So ultraviolet, for example, doesn't pass. Also, as the lens becomes thicker, uh, you will have absorption and other problems. The glass lens being so large, because you have to make it large, as I said initially, because I want to collect more light, so I have to make the objective bigger and bigger. There will be many bubbles, imperfections left. So it's not easy to make a, a big glass lens. And also, uh, the telescope becomes very heavy on the objective side. So you have to put a counterweight on the other side. And this becomes increasingly difficult. And the glass lens, although it's a glass, it also sags. Just like if you take a piece of paper and its own weight, it will sag. The same thing happens in glass, although this is happening in angstroms and uh, microns, but we are talking of optics, all that matters. So very soon people came to mirror-based or reflected telescope. This is a concave, it can be parabolic, and there is a flat mirror here, and the light comes out from here. The other option was, so anyway, first let us see what are the advantages. They do not suffer from chromatics. So the major issue about the color aberration is gone. The objective mirror is at the back side, so it can be made as large as possible. And of course, you can, you still have the counterweight issue here, but it helps you to put the instruments on, on the back side. They are much cheaper to make. Uh, firstly, because as I said, uh, there is no big lens involved here. So the quality of optics of glass, is doesn't come, there's no absorption taking place, except in the instrument or in, in the eyepiece. Also, another thing, very important point is that the light is getting reflected from one surface, the first surface. Of course, there is a tertiary and secondary mirror. So each, so I forgot to mention in case of lens, each time a light ray hits a lens, some of you have a spectacle, you would have noticed that uh, if you tilt the spectacle, you can see there is a, a multicolor thing, which is basically anti-reflection coating. Uh, this means each surface of the glass, irrespective of whether it is a spectacle or any glass, you take the first ray hits as it goes further from that surface, 4% absorption takes place. So, what does ARC do? Anti reflection coating. 
it makes that 4% to 1%. That's a technology which I will not spend time here, uh, which of course distributes the energy in other bands. So that's only a quick answer to that. So ARC is very important, which is must in a glass-based optics. Whereas mirrors themselves are made of either aluminum coating, sometimes gold. So the reflectivity can be as high from almost up to 90 to even uh, uh, silver can be much higher, but silver tarnishes, but gold can go up to 95%. And gold has better reflectivity in infrared papers. So these things are technical reasons why reflectivity base thing is much better. Uh, it is the disadvantage is that it can go out of alignment. And that's why in the night, every night when you're observing with a telescope, whether it's a small telescope, big telescope, you have many times you have to adjust the focus, you have to adjust sometimes uh, just before the observations, you have to take many uh, images to check whether the focusing is all right. And since this telescope is open, I mean, most of the small telescopes are covered, but we will see some pictures where the telescope is open from all sides for the reason that the air circulation inside the dome takes place. It uh, normalizes the air with the outside. So, which means that a lot of dust collects on the mirror surface, which is a major drawback. So, once in a month, people have to clean the dust. There are various techniques. A dusty atmosphere is also bad for such a so These are the drawbacks. And, uh, okay, this, uh, okay, this, I will skip this point. I will just briefly mention that I told you in astronomy, uh, it doesn't matter whether you are seeing a star, whether it is inverted image, because star is a point object and the point object will always be seen as a point object. However, you can use uh, these uh, things to see terrestrial objects, like a distant tree or something from a ship. Then you need to uh, correct the image or make it vertical. So this is called the Gregorian. But this is not so popular. The other important point here is in this, although this picture is small, this secondary mirror has to be supported by these trusses. These are support system, there are typically three. And obviously this is giving a shadow to the overall mirror area, but it's very small. So the advantages are so large that this can be really uh, not so important. This is the same image of the earlier one, except that you can have an eyepiece here. So most of these uh, small telescopes are of this type, which are available even in India. You can buy them from many, uh, these are called Topsonian and other things, which basically have a side view. It's not very convenient because you have to have this 90 degree bend in getting the object. So even better is if you have an eyepiece here. So that's how the Cassegrain telescope came up. And here there is a hole from which the light comes out. And actually, mostly that piece of glass which comes out is made as a secondary mirror. So this is the way you do it, and it gets focused here. Uh, I'll skip this. Skip this. Okay. Uh, now, uh, oops. this. Uh, these are the two types of focusing these telescopes. One is Nasmith, which is similar to this except that uh, you have a third mirror, third mirror somewhere here, where you take the light out from the side. That happens uh, to put heavier instruments on the air. And sometimes you can also have a thing called a fiber which goes into a next room where a spectrograph which can be as big as a room can be put. So these things were developed in the last 40, 50 years. And I will briefly mention these things when we talk spectroscopy later. So yeah, this is the, the arrangement where this is called a tertiary mirror, mirror, the third mirror, which takes the light out. But earlier when we were doing our PhDs, there used to be a Kude room next to this where all this light was taken. But the technology changed and you have optical fibers which can take this light with some losses, of course, to almost longer distance and more convenient uh, to have a spectrograph in the in the adjacent room. Now, before I move on to uh, the photometry and other things, this is just a slide. Uh, a, it's not connected to the topic which I am talking, but this is a very common information which all of you doing experimental physics, for that matter, observational astronomy is important. 
So all I am defining here in very simple way, of course, the best reference for this is Bevington's book or Sean series. But many times people miss out these things, you see. So mean deviation, mean deviation, all these you must have been familiar. I'm just mentioning this because of these last three things which will show up in the next slide that what is plus minus one sigma error bar plus minus two and plus minus three. When you say plus minus three, you're almost taking 99% of the scatter. So that's what is coming up in this picture here. I have just made a plot of X and Y axis of some data, right? These are actually, these are spectral types of uh, almost uh, 600 uh, stars. So all these dots are individual spectra. Now on this axis, each of them have this allocated number and a corresponding number on this, depending on the way I have classified. So essentially it's a scatter plot, which can be from any data. And what is the, oops, what is the central line here? It's the best fit line, best fit deviation line, which you can do by any integration. So it is y is equal to mx plus c. So this is the, the, the slope and this is the, the intercept here, right? Um, now I have drawn basically the same one, two, three sigma here and in different colors. So the outermost is red, which is three sigma, which takes care of almost 99% of the scatter. Of course, there are outliers one, two, and three, which are even outside this three sigma because these two, these points have to be thought why, why they are outliers. But that's of course the physics or astrophysics. The whole picture is to show you where we are with this blue line at two sigma and one sigma. So this kind of things, and this is true also for any other fit, even if it's a Gaussian curve and you're fitting, these three numbers will still be same. Now like this, I will be defining many things in this part of the day and so also in tomorrow's talk. So very basic definitions will come. The next thing is stellar magnitude. Now, again, some of this must have been covered in Chiyanand or some other talks, I am not aware, but it's best to start from very basic here. Firstly, astronomy itself is a very old subject as you already know about Galileo and then it's a subject so old that people don't like to change the definitions, which means if telescope and human eye was the only thing, even today, unfortunately, that is not the case. If that was the case, then today we would have been still stuck with all these basic definitions. And the astronomers don't like to change these old definitions. So this whole scale is a log scale, you can see. On the left side is bright and the minus numbers are more and more brighter and plus numbers are fainter. So essentially I have given the sun, which is right here. So in fact, if we were in a lecture room, the sun's magnitude is almost outside the lecture hall. It's so bright, right? Then is the moon, the Venus, the Vega, all of you know, uh, is the zero magnitude star. The Sirius is somewhere here, minus one point something. Now Sirius is the brightest star, of course, not the nearest. We'll come to that definition very soon. Uh, so the point which I'm trying to make here is, this side is all the faint stars, right? And remember here, this I should have highlighted this apparent stellar magnitude. We have not yet put distance in this game at all. And astronomy from beginning, I should say, is a subject where everything is related. Whatever I define as distance is still peanuts to what long and very far distances are. And somebody in the earlier talk mentioned spectroscopic parallax. I will only hint at it. So, and then there is, cosmic cosmology and parallax. So there are various levels, you know, distances can be anything. So we'll come to that. Right now we are talking of only apparent magnitude. And human eye, not me with a spectacle, but anybody who doesn't have a spectacle in an absolute dark night, not in a city, you have to go to village or some dark place and with no moon, you will be able to see plus six typically, good eyesight, right? But then stars can be much, much fainter. In fact, uh, since I'm not going to talk on detectors, but now with the modern large telescopes and modern detectors and with whole light integration, people have seen arms of galaxies which are very faint, even 25 or even fainter. So this, you remember in your mind, this is the picture of magnitudes, but also remember this is apparent magnitude. Okay, so let's move. So this slide, talks a little more about apparent magnitudes. 
again by definition because you and i remember always that telescopes came much later only 100 years back the the not sorry not the telescope the photoelectric telescopes where a detector could measure the light okay so here uh, you see the two magnitude difference between stars is shown so if the magnitude difference is 5 the light output is 100 times so that gives me this log scale this is also very basic why log scale is important here, it is quite natural. In fact, all of you have heard about decibels, I'm sure. So human ear, the hearing levels are in decibels. It's a log scale. Same way, the human eye sensitivity is also in log scale. In fact, if it were not a log scale, things would have been really disastrous. So I can just, in an audience, I could have asked this question. Um, so suppose you are sitting in a room where you are watching this on your computer. If you switch off all the lights, possibly even switch, uh, bring down the intensity of your screen. And after some time, you will start seeing, if it's a totally dark room, or let's say do it in the night, you'll see, start seeing some faint things. That level and the level when now it is almost uh, quarter to three, you walk out everywhere in the country, there's a bright sun there, the light level is very bright. I'm talking of light level. I have not even talked about photons or, or any such thing, just the level difference. So I ask this question very commonly to everyone uh, in this uh, interaction mode, we can't do it. But many people answer, okay, the level difference is 100, 10, 20, 2000. So all are wrong. The correct answer is 1 million, 10 to the power 6. So imagine a level difference of 1 million if we didn't have log scale, it would have been impossible to accommodate this. So it is six scales which the human eye can adjust to. I'll come to this again. So here, basically, two stars of equal magnitude, the flux difference is same. Stars of five magnitude difference, flux difference is 100. And this is the formula m1 minus m2. And this is log 10, 2.5, f2 by f1. Remember, this is f2 by f1. I can flip this f2 by f1 is 10 to the power this. Now, if you go back to my previous slide, this one, so sun is minus 26. So if it was on a lecture hall, the sun would be sitting outside that hall. You now it's so bright. Sirius, even the brightest star is minus one. And with all this concept, I can make a very crude formula, a limit for a telescope of diameter d, where d is in millimeter can be given by this formula, just from the definition. And I make this small table here, nice table. Human eye limit from this same thing. Why 6.5, you can calculate later. Our human eye people uh, in totally dark adapted can be up to 6 mm, right? So if you put those numbers here, you will get 6.5, roughly. Which means a dark adapted normal human eye without spectacle in a dark night will be able to see up to sixth magnitude stars. And this number is not going exponentially or it has a logarithmic effect here. If I use a six inch telescope or an 18 inch, the numbers are going like this. You are still on log scale. Now, slowly I'm going to define distance again in a relative way. So what happens is this is sun, January, July, six months apart Earth's position and this is a star for which I want to measure the distance from this. And this distance is so large, this distance doesn't matter really. This is a very small angle as we will see very soon. So <clears throat> what's happening is this star is closer to us compared to a background stars, which are much farther away. And there are of course stars even outside this computer screen and so on. So right now we are measuring this angle and by a simple tan theta, you can measure this, right? And tan theta theta is so small, so it will be basically theta. So that is called the astronomical parallax. So here we are defining that angle, this small angle, just one arc second, one by 36 hundredths of a degree, is called one parsec. Remember one PC. Half that angle will be double the distance, two parsec, right? And so on. So this is 0.1, then this will be 10 parsec. Now comes the interesting part. Most of the stars 
even the nearest star, now I'm not talking of the brightest star series, even the nearest star, which is Alpha Centauri, is still below one arc. So imagine even the nearest star, forget moon or planets which are much closer, the nearest star is also subtending an angle less than one arc. And by this method called trigonometric parallax, you can go up to 100 parsecs, which is 0 0.01 arc. Because then the angle measurements become inaccurate. Then you have to use other tools like spectroscopic parallax and so on. So again, I'm not going to talk about that. Now, just some numbers. The nearest star, I said less than one arc second, it's 4.3 light years. Even the nearest star, the light takes 4.3 light years to come. Sun, light comes in about eight minutes. 1.3 parsec, convert this, and this is an angle. That is the less than one arc second. 10 parsec, as I just now said, is 0.1. 1 parsec is 3.26 light years, and 1 light year is almost 10 to the power 13 kilometers. Okay. So these are again definitions. This is now a comparison between absolute and apparent. I'm very soon coming to defining what is absolute magnitude in the next slide, in fact. So what is happening now? This is just showing a picture of the stars series. This is now almost setting, but in January or February is the best time to see this will be almost overhead. Uh, so this is Sirius seen here and apparent magnitude. But now suppose there is a circle here. So I have not yet talked about, I have talked about distances, of course. So if I assume a circle or a sphere, actually, this is two dimensions, so I can't show a sphere. This to our solar system is somewhere here, center. It's so small that I can't show it here. This distance is 10 parsec. This radius is 10 parsec. So Sirius is still there, but other stars come closer now, right? Because I'm covering a bigger, bigger volume. So now I'm basically defining the absolute magnitude. What is it? And remember something which I will come very soon, what is called as V-band. The V stands for visible. The human eye has optical sensitivity in the visible, that is yellow green region. That's why conventionally, again, astronomy is an old subject. It was called V visible band. So these are all, we are talking of a V band. It can be blue, it can be red, it can be others also. So right now we are sticking to V band, the band which is seen by human eye. So now suppose we define a distance from our, whether it's earth or sun, it doesn't matter because these distances are much larger. So we define a shell, uh, let's say a, a empty shell, which is 10 parsec away from us. The radius of the shell is 10 parsec which means now I have an hypothetical shell. So if, if you are finding difficulty, think of a transparent uh, football, the diameter is 20 parsec. Okay, and we are at the center of this. And for a moment, think all the objects which you see are sitting on that surface of that shell, which means whatever object is inside that shell has moved back to this shell. Whatever is outside the shell for a moment has come to this shell which means now all are at same distance from us, which is 10 parsec. So a star which was 40 parsec, which was outside that, has come to this, right? Which means it has come four times closer and one by r square law, 16 times brighter. And what is 16 times? You do the log scale, it makes this three magnitude brighter. So a star which at 40 parsec was plus nine, and note I have made small m for apparent, capital M for cap, uh, absolute, V stands for visible, plus nine. By that log scale of few slides back, this will be three times magnitude brighter, plus nine will become plus six, brighter. So now it is sitting at 10 parsec, so I can easily call this as capital M for six. So now you know what is happening, it's small mv is plus nine, capital M V is six plus six, so I have this minus this is related to the distance of the star. So just a bit. It will come a little later, but it doesn't matter. Okay, sorry. Uh, so anyway, uh, this uh, gives you a relation from the parallax. You can find the distance. Okay, now let's move on. Uh, I'm soon going to go into black body radiation. Uh, uh, before that, let's say this is the spectrum of a star, a typical star. 
right? And what the colors show are your typical colors, ultraviolet, blue, right? Visible, oops, R, red, and I, for infrared, and more, right? And I purposely put the colors. This picture is not, has not come so clean. And I also am defining something. I will come to black body soon. But you see these curves which I show here, these, the V, R, and N. So this is visible red, I, blue. These are basically the photometric bands. So, uh, and these are typically about 1,000 angstrom. Angstrom is the wavelength on x-axis. So blue, green is here, red is here. So visible, the center is at about 5,500. Blue, the center is at about 4,500. And red is at around 6,500, right? So you're more or less 1,000 angstrom white. So you're, when you, these are actually color glasses. So if you see a white light source through this, it will look either blue, V, visible, or yellow, green, or red, depending on what filter you have used, which are essentially called the photometric bands. Now coming back to the distance and a comparative, I'll come back to that photometry again. Now the same table, the sun was minus 26. It was sitting outside the lecture hall. What is the capital MV? Sun is actually a very faint star. It's just because it is so close to us, it looks so bright. It's actually plus 4 point plus 5. Sirius changes the sign. Rigel is a star which is actually very bright. Betelgeuse, the red giant, is actually a bright star. And Vega, interestingly, that's why in some sense, Vega for many years people have considered it as a standard star because it is coincidentally sitting exactly at that shell which is at 10%. So if I observe Vega with my telescope, with my instrument, and let's say I get 220 counts, and one of you from the audience measures with your telescope setup, I'm assuming that sky is ideal, everything is ideal. And getting, so instead of 222, you get 322. Now I can cross calibrate your scales. And now if I, or you observe anything, everything can be calibrated to one standard. That's why this is called a standard star. And this is that formula I was mentioning, capital M minus M. Pi stands for the parallax angle in arc second or this is D, here distance is in parsec. Okay. Now, there is something uh, which you don't have to go in very much in detail. Firstly, this name here is a British uh, royal family, but he was an astronomer, the Ro Lord Raleigh. There are two places and some more places where his name will come. He defined something called Raleigh criteria. And it's a simple, this number looks large, but I will come back to this uh, very soon. So he made this formula 1.22 lambda by D, where lambda is the wavelength. Just now we talked about visible wavelength. We can take it as 5,500 angstroms. And lambda, and then D is the diameter of the telescope in units, of the same units, of course, because this is an angle. So it has to be a kind of a dimensionless thing. So this is the angle which you can resolve. So human eye, take an example. Very few people will have one arc. Remember now it is not arc second, this is one arc minute. One arc minute, absolute sharp vision, clear vision, comfortable four arc minute. Uh, this is what the reality criteria says. That means if there are two stars, which are, and assuming they are of equal brightness, they are so close that if you, I mean, the picture, if you take, they really don't look as there are actually airy bands here. Uh, so airy patterns. I will not go into detail immediately in this particular slide. So these two cross points between these two, if this point and this is 80%, then he would say, or the Rayleigh criteria would say there are two stars. But of course, it's, uh, it's, it's a definition. One can always have this fellow much fainter, then you won't see this cross point here, it may just, I'm just assuming that you will get a kink here and come like this, right? Which means, even though they are not equal brightness, the very fact that you could resolve it as a kink in the profile, uh, there are double stars. In fact, a very important information I should convey here that most of the stars in the night 
in a good clear light when you see are double stars. 60% of them are double stars, statistics says. And in fact, the way things are happening, again, unfortunately, I won't cover the active and elective optics. Maybe Ram Prakash or somebody will cover. The way technology is going on, this number is changing very fast because atmosphere was obstructing us. People have used space telescopes and now you can use ground-based tools to negate the effect of atmosphere. And whatever you thought were single star are also turning out to be double stars or triple stars. So this is a very interesting thing. And a lot of astrophysics goes in that, stellar dynamics and all, I'm not going into that. But yes, that 60% number is a number which mostly people were knowing all these years, but that number is changing because of the tools uh, which are allowing you to see uh, more and more multiple stars. This is the same thing that angle I was saying, this is just a pictorial. This is called diffraction limit. This is the airy pattern. A typical, very clear sky will show such airy patterns and airy disk. Again, I'm not getting into this uh, issue. But yeah, this particular slide is extremely important for all the future things. Uh, what is shown here, this particular column is showing the diameter of telescopes, right? 50 millimeter means five centimeter. Five centimeter is about two inches, four inches. This is half a meter, right? And what is on this side is that same Rydler criteria R. So you can see this number is becoming smaller. So remember my first few sentences. Now I'm trying to resolve with bigger and bigger telescopes, smaller and smaller angles. So you're sitting in your room and your window, I'm seeing the final details of the window because that angle is becoming smaller now. So 2.3 has become 0.23. And of course, this can go on, you know. In fact, if you see the real world today, people are talking of 16 meter telescopes or 30 meter telescopes. They will be discussed by Ram Prakash at some point. So larger the telescope, this number is continuously becoming smaller, okay? Which means if you just believe this, then all you will be able to see is very, very small part of uh, whatever you are trying to see. So you may be in principle able to see the surface of star, but that doesn't happen because our Atmosphere doesn't allow. And this line here is where atmosphere stops. Means even at ideal places, go on a mountain and go at a very steady night, at the best, you will be able to see about one or less than one oxygen. Because atmosphere is like a turbulence and as if uh, the atmospheric turbulence stops you to see finer things. So this is, a serious problem of atmosphere, which only recently has been taken care of and require a full different talk. But uh, so basically just remember adaptive and active optics. That will uh, is a clue to know what are the latest things in this. Okay. So I will, now I will have to speed up a bit. Magnification, I will just uh, define. It is basically focal length of objective by the eyepiece, that ratio, and the light gathering power, that is the aperture or the diameter of the telescope. So I call it LGP, light gathering power. So a four inch, 100 millimeter telescope and our human eye, eight millimeter dark adapter. We are increasing with a four inch telescope, 156 times more light can be collected. And 156 times you can convert to magnitude that much fainter you can go. Uh, this is that number I was hinting at earlier. This is a very simple thing. Actually, what is this number? This number is number of radians in a degree, right? Okay. So essentially, uh, uh, so what happens? Uh, this is the number of r seconds in one radian. Because this is a very trivial thing on your calculator, you know, when you have to do tan theta, you have to say whether it is, a ratio or it is an angle, right? You have to define other ways to give wrong results. So essentially, radian is, when you say tan theta five by six, five and six are just numbers. And what you get, theta inverse is actually a radian. You have to make a conversion to degree. That's all is hidden here. And when I say, again, this number sounds familiar, mostly this number will become almost extinct with the modern and 
technology on your cell phone camera also you don't have these numbers written but good old camera still have the f number written f3.2 essentially this is the ratio of the diameter affected diameter to the focal length so 11 times is the focal length so if a celestron 8 inch telescope 8 inches the diameter of the telescope the focal length is 88 inches so this is only an idea how if you were to take image of a solar eclipse or lunar eclipse how much will be the image forming on the camera by the way both of these objects this is again coincidence it may not happen for sitting on jupiter the, its moons but for sun and moon on earth they are both about half a degree so you go and put in these numbers you will see that your uh, size of the image will be about 18 millimeter diameter okay uh, telescopes can be used in two different modes one is imaging which means you take image of a galaxy extended object nebulae and all this requires the optics particularly the lenses or the mirrors all the way up to the edge should be perfect you know know what is called optical aberration it's also called uh, other terms are there but i will not get into that but the optics have to be really good whereas in photometry you're not so much interested in taking the actual image all you're interested in the total light you have to collect you have to make sure the focus is okay so even if the optics is somewhat bad your main goal is to collect all the photons in one small circle so it's an aperture or a slit so these are the two major differences i just quickly run through some slides of the typical so alt and azimuth what is altitude? So if you sit here and look towards north, then east, south, and west. So that is 0, north, 90, 180, and 270. And so that is the way the, the azimuth goes. And altitude is where you are sitting. Horizon to zenith is 90 degrees. OK? So this has two motions, this and this, so that I can track the stars. This, the logic is same whether it is a altazimuth or driven by so this is german equatorial mount and this is a horseshoe mount you can see this is like a horseshoe the telescope moves on this axis but when this is sitting here this thing coming out from here has to exactly look at the celestial pole not the pole star okay so mm -hmm. i'll just skip some of these things okay now, in the remaining, let's say, 10-15 minutes, I will cover the black body radiation and its uh, astrophysical implication. Black body, all of you have studied even at BSA level. I don't know whether even at high school it is covered nowadays. So what is black body? It is defined as an object which absorbs and radiates back same 100% efficiency. There is no ideal black body. Although people make tertiary black bodies and other things, there are national institutes of standard in US where they have made something called a primary, but then it is from the theoretical, it has a efficiency factor, not 100%. And what are the three parts? Planck's law, Vienne's displacement law, and Stephen's Boltzmann law. This is a typical black body picture. This is the visible band. And you can see what is happening at a cooler body, 3000 degree Kelvin. The peak is shifting as it becomes hotter, it goes towards blue. This side is smaller wavelength, ultraviolet, infrared, visible. And I have purposely made the colors also here, right? So, <clears throat> and the peak is also shifting. And not only that, the area under this curve, which is the total energy, somewhere in the morning talk, it was talked about Stephen Boltzmann law, we will also talk, talks about the total energy coming out from that body. So this is all an ideal picture. Uh, this is another one, more context with stars, the so yellow stars blue stars. Of course, the stars, although the envelope of the star will look like this, but it will, the spectra will look very different. I will show that probably tomorrow. So what are the basic things? Again, everything is in MK system here, meter square and so on. This is the wavelength formula. This is the frequency formula. So it's a very common thing. This is frequency cube and it is wavelength to the power of five. Why? Because if you take a differentiation of frequency C by lambda, you get this square from from. These are very basic questions we asked even in why what the analysis results. These are the three constants, Planck's, Boltzmann, wavelength in nanometers, speed of light, easy to remember. 
3 into 10 to the power 5, 300,000 meters per second. Now, the Vance displacement law in this condition where h nu by kt is this, h nu by kt or hc by lambda, or hc by lambda. So, this is the Vance displacement law where uh, this uh, comes down to this lambda 5 dependency and Rayleigh Jeans law, lambda 4 here. And remember, this is why you see again the Rayleigh name is here, why the sky looks blue, because is the scattering one by lambda four. Stephen Boltzmann law, when you integrate that Planck's law, this is what you get. Remember, this is the constant. This is proportional to this constant and lambda to the four. This is the total energy coming out of the sphere of the black hole. So suppose it's a star or sun, the total energy in all directions. So if you were to see the star from Earth or see the small spot on sun, then only that part in your field will come out. So it will be a part of this. This is the total energy, right? These are the things here. So suppose star like 5700 degree Kelvin, this is the energy six kilowatt per centimeter square. So now you assume the surface of the sun as a, as a, as a sphere, each centimeter square on that sphere is throwing out this much energy at the surface. Of course, this energy doesn't come all the way to us. It will get scattered, it will get absorbed. Many things will happen. Um, so these are the implications. This is the Vance displacement law, simple. 3 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter Kelvin, lambda max, where the peak of that black body and the temperature. This frequency for the moment, let us not bother, but this is easier to uh, understand. So take an example of star, star whose temperature is 5,000. It looks yellow. 5800 degree angst, uh, angstroms, yellow, yellow color. And three examples here have different lambda max situations. Sun, it's a, I purposely made angstrom to micron. It can be a homework to you. It's very straightforward. 1000 uh, angstroms is uh, actually 0.1 micron, right? A nanometer, 10 nanometer is uh, one micron. So you can see 10,000 angstroms will be one micron. So this conversion, should be in back of your mind because in astronomy, many places, these keep changing. The astronomers like their own preference, somebody and storm, micron, nanometer, and so on. Earth is a good radiator as 10 micron infrared, near infrared. Average temperature 27 degree centigrade, 273 plus 27, 300 degree Kelvin. So this is where the Earth is radiating always, right? And finally, again, on this topic, you will have many, many lectures, cosmic background. It's a millimeter wave, 1000 micron is one millimeter. That's why all the Kobe and later WMAP, all the satellites were using millimeter wave detectors, three degree Kelvin. Again, I'm not going into cosmology, but this is the micro fluctuation on this, where all the cosmology is all about. Uh, this is a quick run on bolometric. Again, I think this Shyanand was covering, but uh, no harm in repeating. Total output now, which we were talking just now, is converted to 4 pi. Here, d is the distance to the star. And you're integrating in all wavelengths and total luminosity in watts. I should caution you this word luminosity can be very confusing, particularly in observational astronomy. You will see it will come in three different places, even in my talk. This is the first time where it is coming as a total energy. It will come when you talk of absorption features of stellar spectra. It will also come uh, in, in a concorded English language, but more as French, when you talk the output of an instrument. So it can be uh, very confusing. That's why better to bear these definitions from beginning. So this is that formula, four pi d square sigma t4 came just now from, from the Stephen Boltzmann law, and it is the reverse of that. Now this word has been introduced here as bolometric. Actually, it comes from the name bolometer. Bolometer is actually an ideal instrument, which means just like an ideal body, it is an instrument which can measure the black body spectrum from all the wavelengths, infinity to infinity, minus to plus, or zero to infinity, at equal sensitivity and efficiency. That is important. So it's an ideal concept. If you make a bolometer in the lab, it will never be that ideal. It will have its own limitations. It will not see all wavelengths. So that's why this, again, the similar terms, apparent bolometer will come 
an absolute bolometer will come, right? So very similar definitions, M ball, again, remember I put small m, is L, that same luminosity by here D is the distance. And same log relation. So this comes from the apparent brightness of the star. So the next slide actually gives out this absolute bolometric magnitude M capital to this. In fact, now we have a bolometric distance modulus M ball by capital M ball gives the distance in parsecs. And as I just now said, nobody can actually measure the ideal fluxes because of various things, you know, the Earth's atmosphere, detector will not be sensitive and so on. So this is for a star and this sign for sun, this is you can measure and this is the difference. And there is something called bolometric correction. So we see, this is again in both in apparent as well as in, uh, an absolute. Now, slowly we are moving into color of stars because we have to go to photometry, we have to go to spectroscopy. I have made this in red color. At low temperatures, we just now saw that the objects look reddish, whereas high temperatures, they look bluish, right? In fact, even higher, they will almost look bluish white or even white. And very soon we will see that stars can be so hot, uh, they look beyond even blue. So. So this definition B and V is coming as a color index here. What is B? Remember, uh, many slides back, I defined magnitude, small m for V visible as 2.5 log of fluxes. This is the same in blue and this is in visible. In fact, this can be measured with a photometer, which we'll see later uh, for any star. And if you take the difference, you calculate the B and V magnitude, this, B minus V if called color index, if it is negative, it must be a hot star or a hot object. Similarly, B minus V if it is positive, it's a cool star. This is a very crude formula, not to be really taken. Directly gives you a temperature if you know B minus V. So what is the effective temperature of a star can be found from Stephen's Boltzmann law, if one can observe and measure the radiation of the star at all wavelengths in absolutely. So I'm now hinting at sigma T4, which means I have now done the integration at all wavelengths, remember. So that is not going to be a practical thing, the volumetric thing. Rather, to get a temperature, you would go by measuring these two magnitudes, the color axis. So spectral sequence, whether it's a star is a hot or a cold, is direct consequence of their temperature sequence. And this has been there for almost more than 100 years when the stellar spectra was, was observed. So the next slide is just, uh, just a joke, of course. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. These are the main spectral types. This is the way people write. But essentially, hottest star, blue, and this is the red star. They are later added different stars. So the next slide is all these. You see the temperatures 50,000. The color is blue, bluish white, white, yellow, white, yellow. So, sun is G. Capella, some of you know, Capella is a yellow star. Okay. Then, orange, red, your uh, little juice or Aldebaran, the star named Rohini, is orange, red. And then, more red. And what is happening on the atmosphere of the stars? Very hot stars. The only light elements remain. Everything else has evaporated. So helium, hydrogen. Then as you have cooler and cooler atmospheres, you have other heavier elements. Finally, you have even molecular bands sitting there. So that's why the spectra, when you see, we will see either today or tomorrow, the hotter stars will have just almost like a black body, except for absorption features of these colors. But cooler stars will have many, many absorption lines over and above sitting on the black body of that particular temperature. So now I'm just almost closing down this. Now you will see this is an HR diagram, which uh, I'm only showing here as a, as a explanation, but not going into detail because uh, all this HR diagram, which is Hertzsprung from Russell diagram, talks about evolution of stars. And most of the stars, in fact, I can give a very good exercise to the students, I do it in MSc. It's, to, it's possible now you go to internet and select 
So this is, what is this axis? This is the OBF, hotter stars and cooler stars. This side is the absolute magnitude, capital M. This is the same luminosity L. And on the bottom you have B minus V here, right? So this is interesting and even better pictures are here. Again here, this side is temperature now, OBA, and this side is the luminosity. So one means sun, sun's luminosity is sitting here and sun is a G type star, I said, it's a yellow green star. So actually this itself, not so colorfully, if you want, you can put, it, put colors. If you just go to the internet and this can be an exercise, you try to dig out a website where they have given table of temperature or spectral types of stars and they have also listed this luminosity. So you just pick up these two tables, use any scatter plotter, whatever Python or whatever plot. And if you take 100, 500 more, the better, you will start seeing nicely the stars, the dots, like my scatter plot few slides back, they will sit here. And some will start sitting here. So what is happening? This is called the main sequence where most of the stars spend their life. But of course, as evolution goes, some go into super giants, giants, white dwarfs. Again, I am not going into that, but it's so important that even getting a HR diagram just from internet, you can plot it and it comes out so well. You can try this. Here's another picture of the same thing. You can see Vega sitting here, Betelgeuse, Regel here, main sequence, Sirius B, white dwarfs. Sirius A is here, Sirius B is a companion. Procyon, Arcturus, which is also a yellow star, Aldebaran. And the same thing, I will skip this. I think this is the last slide here of today and then we will go to questions. Uh, we are almost completed one hour. Uh, not to worry most of this, but except for this. Vega, I told you, zero magnitude star. If you put in the numbers in my formula in the earlier slides, what do you get? A very simple number to remember. 1000 photons per centimeter square per angstrom per second. So what is happening from Vega, the sphere of Vega, the surface of the star, 1000 photons are coming out every second, every centimeter square, and this is just the wavelength band, one angstrom. So suppose I forget atmosphere of Earth, but I'm sitting on space, I use a filter of 1000 angstrom, so this 1000 will multiply with this number, and every second I total this, you will get that many photons. So a very good number to remember, and this is just the conversion. So you can put for a different star magnitude, you can calculate and find the number of photons in these units. So I guess what I will do now is to take some questions. And uh, since I'm coordinating, so let's first take the, the chat questions of Zoom. And I will come to uh, to the YouTube uh, things. So I will just give me one minute. If I mean, there might be common questions, so I will try to combine them. So first one is from Arjun. Uh, Reflected deliver. Do we have inverted image? Okay. The question is uh, refractor telescope. We'll always have inverted image, yes, I said that. And to correct it, particularly for terrestrial, you can use a convex lens. That's what in binocular sometimes is used. Uh, you use a convex lens or a combination of lens. And uh, chromatic aberration, a plano convex, I said it doesn't remove fully, but partially. Uh, then can one count blind spot created by the second? So it's a, the next question from Yashoda. Uh, can one counter the blind spot created by the secondary reflecting metal? Not really, because it's an obstruction, so you can't really, but the amount of obstruction is so little compared to the area and the other advantages, it doesn't matter. Uh, Arjun has again asked, magnitude is only about optical light? No, uh, I already told the magnitude, the small subscript V stands for the visible band, depending on which band you are measuring, it can be infrared magnitude, it can be radio, anything. In case of parallax method, is required to know the distance between the star and sun. In case of parallax method, is it required to know the distance? This, this question is not clear. So he's asking whether the distance between star and sun can be measured by parallax. Actually, 
that is precisely what I said that sun and earth, we are so close compared to those angles. These angles are very small and we can measure only by uh, parallax method uh, up to 0 0.01 parsec. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry, 100 parsec. What is certain equivalence? Why do certain equivalence? Okay, why do filters have these names? So this is again an old concept. Visible band, I already told, uh, is uh, with the human eyes thing. Then later detectors came. Detectors were more sensitive in blue and uh, and some of the silicon base were more sensitive in red. So other bands came in the picture. Eyepiece and resolving power were already defined. How can measure the individual apparent magnitudes of stars in double star system? Okay, this is a slightly good question. Double star, how do you measure the magnitude? So you can't really because both the light will come together unless you resolve them. And that's why more and more resolved stars, when you observe, you can take an image and do on the image work on it. And then you can actually find the individual uh, magnitudes of the double stars. But otherwise, yes, if you are not resolved, you will get a single light. How can we decide about the directions of the marking? Okay, uh, this is a question about again Arjun, but uh, essentially the quick answer is most of the last telescopes because of the mechanical restrictions and about fork mount, they are all alt azimuth telescopes. But that has one limitation exactly at the zenith, the, the orientation changes it has to have be correct uh, another third motor by what is called as a Cassegrain motor. Again, I will not, uh, somebody has asked, Madhura has asked, sharing slides. So I will send these slides to Asim and later whosoever wants, they will be sent. Madhusudan, how can one know some stars? Okay, that is a somewhat uh, interesting question. How does one know some star is visible red or blue due to temperature or by due to Doppler shift? So this will become clear tomorrow. Yes, Doppler shift is important. If the star is moving at a very high speed, it will be either shifted towards red or blue. So, uh, but that needs spectroscopy to be done. Simple photometry will not be done. But to know the temperature, you have to do actually. Uh, so it's a it's an involved process. Either you measure the total energy. There is another way to measure the diameter of the star by occultation, which is a very a direct measurement. But very few occasions happen where you have a occultation. So that gives you the diameter of the star, and then diameter can be connected to temperature. Uh, we don't see purple star. Does that look at possible? Uh, somebody has asked about Tanishka, about uh, purple star. So firstly, I should uh, uh, accept that I am colorblind. For me, purple and blue will be similar. In fact, I should also, as a side remark, people should know that most of the men, 60% of them are colorblind. This may be shock to you. But also, I should tell you, many women are also colorblind. Anyway, this is only a side remark. But yes, no, purple star, basically, hotter and hotter stars will have the black body radiation going on the ultraviolet side. So obviously, you will not see them in, in the normal colors. Color index for blue is presentation after the session. This is already what it is. So difference between positions of star on the HR diagram, Arjun has asked. Again, uh, HR diagram is a very standard thing. You can refer to some uh, books for this. I will not spend, but of course, somebody will talk about uh, stellar evolutions. It will come under that. Uh, stellar ages, judges change. Yes, because of the evolution on the HR diagram, its color can also change depending where it moves on the HR diagram. Uh, Dr. Tamal. How to measure radial velocity of a moving star? This will come tomorrow when we talk about radial velocity with spectroscopy. Color aberration of reflection. That I already mentioned how to do that. Limiting magnitude expression of telescope was a crude experiment. Uh, it was just from the magnitude definition. Uh, Uh, somebody called Navalil, Navalil Shah has asked, value of sun is minus 26, but uh, was plus four, uh, the absolute magnitude. Then if you are bringing the star closer and brightness is increased, then also it is given positive value. See, 
uh, you are confusing between the magnitude scale. Plus means faint and minus means bright. Just because sun is close, it is minus 26. But when you take sun back to that shell of 10 parsec, it will become a faint star. That's why it will become plus four. Uh, uh, it says, uh, the last one says, I think this is the last one I will take. Uh, Vega has zero magnitude as a reference point or scale design first and then found magnitude as zero. Uh, this is a bit historical, whether Vega itself became the zero magnitude or not. I really can't answer it when I have to check. But uh, it, maybe it is coincidence that uh, the way they measured, they found Vega was coincidentally at 10 percent. But again, being all historical, people don't want to change these differences. It could have been really different uh, if it was uh, today with uh, CCDs and other things. Uh, I will quickly come back to Zoom if there are any uh, questions on Zoom. But uh, let me just go to uh, YouTube and check what questions are there. So, uh, Ranjan, yes. while you are doing that, I will just quickly announce at 4 p.m. today, we have an Ayuka colloquium by Professor Francois Combs from, uh, from IAP Paris. And you can view this colloquium on the same YouTube channel where we are streaming these lectures. Okay, so on the schedule, if you go to the schedule, uh, we have the link given there. And you can use that link to go to the YouTube channel. And at 4 p.m., we will have an Ayuka colloquium. If you are interested, please join us there. Okay, thanks, Asim. Now I'm going to the YouTube uh, questions. Uh, I'll just pick up some of them, which make sense. Um, is it useful to increase the number of optics uh, in a telescope? Yes, but then the absorption of the glass will come. So that's the drawback. But yes, many sophisticated instruments do have a lot of optical surfaces, but they use anti-reflection coating, as I said. Uh, bolometric correction, how to find, that was already defined in the talk. Uh, now, somebody is asking whether the definition of this magnitude scale can be rever reversed, but it's only a concept, so you don't... That's what I said, that uh, that concept doesn't need to be changed because it has been there for years. In principle, yes, if CCDs were there 100 years back, maybe everything would have been linear scale. Okay, somebody says plane mirror can be put on the other side of the normal reflection laser to stop the dust. Yes, this is done in soft, uh, in small telescopes called a corrector plate, but essentially you can't do it in large telescopes. Uh, so you have to clean the mirror always. Optical aperture synthesis. Uh, somebody is asking about optical aperture synthesis. This is relating to the active adaptive optics. So I will leave it there. It requires a full lecture. So some many people are asking about reference, which will come in uh, tomorrow's last part of my talk, almost the last slide. Um, plate scale, I've already defined. Um, I think I have covered all the YouTube ones. Um, on Zoom, let's see if there are any hands. So how do I? Can people ask on Zoom? I, uh, the coordinator can somehow my Zoom window is not seen. Yeah, so maybe also we have to wrap up soon. Yeah, uh, I can. Because uh, the Ayuka Colloquium will start yes, at yes, four yes. and they need some time to, to prepare. True, 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 true. So anybody wants to ask quickly, you can ask uh, Asim or somebody can unmute them and I can verbally yeah, answer. If you want to raise hands and ask questions, one last question we can take. Okay, there is Baishali Mandal. I'm on yes. Go ahead. Yeah, ask Baishali. Hello, sir. Uh, if a star is already moving, then uh, if we want to measure the distance by parallax, uh, there would be some uh, problem in the precision, right? Uh, you are saying the star is moving and if I measure by parallax, what will happen? Firstly, the star movements are so small in these scales, you can't decipher that. And of course, it has, a, it has a, some importance in this question that 
at very distant objects, not just even stars, the movements, for example, arms of galaxies and so on, people have to wait for many, many, I mean, many years sometimes. And there are other ways of seeing whether the movement has been seen by an indirect method. So, uh, but the question for parallax method doesn't really apply here because we are talking of very close by objects and they do move so slowly that you won't see. There is a, a parallactic motion also and that many satellites have measured nearby objects to a great accuracy. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you.